My name is Erica Benson. I'm the Interim Director of the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, and I am delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dr. Amanda Profazer. And I think we have a lot of people here today for this talk because we all like period dramas, musicals, opera, the theater, and the thing that we, one of the things we like about them are the costumes. And so we're gonna hear more about that today, but I first wanna say a little more about our speaker. So Amanda received her Master's of Fine Arts in Costume Design from Utah State University in 2006 and served as her Costume Shop Manager and Adjunct Faculty of Costume Construction and Technology from 2001 to 2011. She has designed costumes for the Old York Repertory Company, Utah Festival Opera and Musical Theater, and the Grand Theater. She worked as a Costume Shop Technician for the Utah Shakespearean Festival, Pioneer Theater Company, and also served as a design assistant with NBC Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. Amanda has been a part of the UWO Player family since 2011. Some of Amanda's favorite designs include Sweeney Todd, West Side Story, Pirates of Penzance, James and the Giant Peach, Company, King Lear, Medea, and An Inspector Calls. Amanda and her husband Landon have two beautiful children, Ruby, who is 15, and Pearl, 11, as well as a 90-pound golden doodle named Penny. And two kittens, not to leave out the feline lovers, named Fish and Mittens. So the title of today's talk is Historical Costume Patterning. We'll have some time after the presentation for questions. And for our remote viewers, if you have a question, please email them to orsp at uwec.edu, and we will read them off for our presenter. Again, that's orsp at uwec.edu. And I will ask you, Dr. Profeser, if we do have questions from the audience, if you could please repeat those mm -hmm. for the online viewers, because they, they uh, won't be able to hear them as well. There will also be a recording of this presentation posted on our website within the next week or so for later viewing. So join me in welcoming Dr. Profeser. to be here and I'm grateful for this opportunity. I see lots of familiar faces, which is nice because, you know, it's like, okay, my team is here, which is awesome. So um, our pro like the project that I'm going to be talking about is um, costuming, um, historical costuming, and then the patterning that was, um, that came from the ORSP grant. So, and the ORSP, it was with myself and then Abby Alvarez, which is right over there. So hopefully we can get them up and have them um, share a couple of experiences with them. So I first want to, um, a lot of people ask me, you know, first of all, when they go, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a costume designer. There's lots of things like, oh, you must love Halloween. Sure, you know, <laughs> or your kids must have the best Halloween costumes. Yep, we go to Target. Yeah, I mean, all of, all of the things or costume storage. But I also say that as a costume designer, um, I, like, I usually show my, like my headshot of how I look kind of fancy, but this is how I usually look. Um, I have a wacky job, right? And I'm lucky that I um, have, th that I get to do what I love to do. Um, and I get to put funny stuff on my head. So like when in doubt, if you have a gold lame bicorn, I hope that you put it on your head and take a picture of it. Um, all of these are, when I think about being a costume designer, I usually have my, my bag, my hands are usually full of bags. My husband calls me the bag lady. I have bags inside of other bags inside of other bags. Like this picture here is me showing up to the costume studio working on company. And I even turned to um, Ali Timi, who is our shop manager, and I was like, take a picture of me, because I just look so sad, and I don't even have the right shoes on, right? <laughs> so this is like usually what I look like. I usually have caffeine, um, and I do s swear when you get poked, because it, like, it hurts. Every time you get stabbed like with a pin, it hurts. Um, and so this is, this is me on a regular basis. I, I, became, I got involved in theater when I was uh, um, in young, in middle school, because I actually have a stutter. 
And my speech therapist said to my mom, you should get her into drama. It will really help with her speech. And it really did. And so um, I started in like in, um, in drama and then I also sewed. So when you're sewing and you're in theater, there you go. Um, and I went to New York City at the age of 16 and I saw my first real Broadway show. And I said, I have to do this for the rest of my life. And I've been doing it for the rest of like my whole life. So my first real professional job was at 21 working at Utah Shakes. I'm 45 and this is what I've been doing. So this is, this is me. Um, if you ever see me, I usually have bags inside of other bags and I'm wearing something silly. So I wanted to kind of start the conversation or start the, uh, this, this you know, presentation about what is it that theater is. Like theater is a team sport. That's what I love about the most about it. Like, right, there's lots of people. So here's a diagram for a lot of the, the uh, or like if you're a non-theater person about how everybody is really connected. Um, and everybody in theater has a specific job and, it's, and, and specific training. But we're all working together on the same product or the same uh, show or the same production. But we're all within each other together, um, which is really important. So this is everybody's job. But then I wanted to kind of focus on the costume studio. What is it that or who is all in charge of in a costume studio? So we have a costume designer, an assistant costume designer. We have a studio supervisor or manager. We have cutter drapers, and that's what I'm going to talk a lot about, the relationship between the costume designer and the cutter draper. We have a first hand, which is underneath the cutter draper. We have stitchers who report to the first hand. We have the shop manager who has to remember everything to make sure that everything is processing. We have craft people, so all of the bits from purses to umbrellas to all of that. We have a dyer painter if we need fabric that's dyed or, or has some, you know, whatever we need to do on it. And then we have a wardrobe supervisor. So once the show is out of the shop and into production, right, that we are, that we are now producing the show, um, they're in charge of making sure that laundry is done, the actors are getting dressed, all of that kind of stuff. But when we talk about this ORSP grant in you know, like particular, it's the cutter draper. What is the responsibility of the cutter draper? So a cutter draper develops the pattern. So as a costume designer, I give a, like a, a rendering and then the cutter draper is responsible for then making the pattern. Yes, we make our patterns, right? It is a skill set. Um, they coordinate uh, the construction of how it's going to be put together. They give instructions to the first hand that then gives it to the stitchers. Um, they attend all of the fittings, all, um, all of that to make sure that we're fitting the garment correctly. And it supervises alterations because they're the person that's inside the fittings, making sure that everything kind of fits well. The costume shop manager is, is, is overseeing that. But this is the role of a cutter draper. And this was what I really wanted to focus the ORSP uh, grant on with Abby. It's giving them an opportunity to know what it is to be a cutter draper and to gain those skills. So when we decided to why this project or what is our purpose or our process so um abby was actually uh, they were they work in the shop they are still working on you know the shop and um because eau claire is a our theater program is a ba program and it's a generalist program so i went to a bfa program and i emphasized in costume design that was my track so all of the classes i took helped me become a costume designer um, but we don't have that track here. We don't have, we're not a BFA program. So there's, I somewhat briefly talk about pattern um, drafting in my theater techno costume technology class, but it is like the surface of it. It's like skimming it. Um, and I, Abby is, is, was in the shop and I wanted to, to find a way for them to be able to get more opportunities to learn this the skill and they were interested in doing it. So I approached Abby and I was like, Abby, is this something that you would like to do? Um, and of course they were like, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> I hope you are, like, right? Okay. Um, I jumped up and down at the yes, um, because I, because what they want to do is go into costuming. So that's what's so great about ORSP is an opportunity to give these 
these this one on one skill set that then they can keep on on building upon, um, especially through our department. Like, right. Um, so when we figured out, well, what was this going to look like? And I love to curricularize as many things as possible as an educator. And I said, we're going to do this, but then I want it to be completely attached to a production. And so it was going to be attached to Silent Sky, which is um, what we were doing in the spring semester. So I knew that it was going to have be directly related and that they were going to be able to see how it all connects. Right. So when we first started in in the summer, we did basic body block patterning. And I'll talk a little bit like more about that in just a few minutes. But we went from basic body block patterning. Then we went to half scale uh, historical patterning. And then we moved to construction of the half scale um, pattern to a garment. And then we and then they served as the cutter draper for uh, head over heels, but really silent sky. So that was kind of what we were hoping for for this project. But I'm going to have to step back a few seconds to just go back to be how do we get to be like, where do we get the information to give to the cutter draper? Right. And it all starts with the director or the process. So theater is all about a process like right. And the director, I always think of a director as like the helm of the ship. Right. They are the, the train conductor We're getting on this train and they're leading us to the overall look of the show. What is the production concept? So we meet like with the director and they get and Jennifer Chapman gave us what she wanted for the overall look for the show. The thing about Silent Sky is it's rooted with real people. It's real people that existed in a real specific time in science. So these, to me, that was really important as a costume designer is like, how do I tell these, these women who really opened the doors for other female scientists to come through? Because they matched the stars, right? They were called computers. And it started at the turn of the century and we end almost at the, the beginning of, or, or the late 1910s, teens. So there was lots of things that I needed to do as a costume designer to help tell that story. And what is it that a responsibility as a costume designer, what do we do? Right. So um, Jennifer Chapman came in. She, they, she gave us her, 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 her production ideas. And then I did the research and sketches. And then I do costume plots and I have to figure out fabric. And then I do we do the patterning and then we do mock ups and we do fittings and then we do fashion fabric. and We do more fittings. <laughs> and more meetings and more paperwork. And then we get into dress rehearsal and then we strike it, right? There's always an opening night and there's always a closing night. That's what I love about theater, right? So I wanted to briefly kind of go through the research to then help tell, connect through the patterning. So here are some of uh, just some research ideas that I brought to the table to, you know, the team of each character um, in their act one versus their act two. Act one being the turn of the century, the beginning, and then we have the late teens. And fashion changes dramatically, especially for women um, and, and what's happening. I always say that fashion isn't an island. It's a response to what's happening. Um, and it was definitely a response. So here's um, some like research for Henrietta and then Margaret, their, their sisters. Um, I also had to think about the elements of design of how I can connect these people and how I can help tell who, who is who um, and just their personalities as well using the elements of design like line, shape, color, texture, all of that kind of stuff. So here's Margaret. Both Henrietta and Margaret are sisters. And then we have Annie. Um, at one part in the play, she's wearing pants, which is like, oh my gosh, like what happened. So we were able to uh, to find a historical pattern and then to be able to recreate those. But here's some examples of Annie. She's all she's a part of like the women the suffrage movement. So how um, to do that? And then we have Wilhelmina. Um, and then so we have all of the research. And then I go to the rendering. So this is a rendering of a couple of the costumes that I bring to the team. This is also something that I'll show to. Uh, the shop manager 
to the cutter draper, but then there's also something called a technical drawing. So a technical drawing is all of the really important information that needs to go into a pattern, right? From uh, like, where's the closures, the trim, is it pleats, is it pin tucks, is it lace, is it all of that kind of stuff to communicate that to the cutter draper. Because their job is to take the rendering, to take the drawing, to take the research, and then to create a pattern. And that's what, what Abby, and then also Ali Timi, who's the shop manager, also um, does quite a bit of patterning as well for our shop. So then we go to the project, like the ORSP stuff. So when we met in the summer, we started with the basic patterning. So in patterning, there's really three different ways to pattern a garment. One, you can drape it. You can drape it on a mannequin or you can drape it on an actor, like, right? I've done both. Um, you can do drafting, which is you take all of the measurements and it's a big, huge math problem, as in like a story problem. And it's super, if you're really good at math, I do not like, like drafting at all. Cause I'm like, I don't want to do that. Right. It's like A to B and then you take half of A and then you move it to C. It's like, nope, I'm not doing that. Okay. <laughs> and then we have body blocks. So a body block or is really, a um, the pattern that has all of the, the darts to be really a fitted garment. And from that, you can manipulate the darts into so many different designs, right? So Abby right here is holding, and we do half scale, because it's easier to learn on a half scale than a full scale, right? And you can move faster. So uh, Abby is holding the body block of a back. So this is a bodice back. So we have a, a waist dart and then we have a shoulder dart because humans are tubes, right? And actors like to move, hopefully, <laughs> right? Um, directors get upset when they can like move, right? So from the basic of like how to just take two darts and move it to one dart or to move the butt, like the, the, the bust dart to the waist dart. So we just did the basic of pattern manipulation and then we took that and then we did extreme patterning, which I would say is historical patterning. Like, right? So it's like the extreme sport. It's like tailoring. Tailoring is just extreme sewing, like, right? So this is us um, but going over some, just some basic patterning. And they're so happy to be there. Um, look, she's using her kindergarten skills, which is taping and cutting and, and pivoting and moving and all of that. That's what I love about body blocks is I'm a very visual learner and you can be like if I take this and move it here I can see what it does so th this is Abby like using her kindergarten skills of cutting and then here are some examples of some of the half scales so with this one up here this is just a sleeve that was a fitted sleeve but we use what's called the slash and spread um, technique that then made it be a puff sleeve. Um, we made like this is when you want to do um, uh, like a, a sleeveless bodice, right? We like we took and we made a princess seam. So taking a bodice front and a bodice back and making it be princess seams. Um, all of this was actually a historical which we did uh, during the Regency period. So the, these are just some examples of the techniques that Abby used to then to create a pattern. Um, so basic, some basic patterning. Then what they had to do is they made the patterns, but then it's one thing to make the patterns, then we actually have to do it, right? <laughs> we have to make it. And to learn that, the best way is you have to then construct the garment. So I gave um, Abby specific to time periods where I gave them a drawing and then they had to make the pattern and then they had to construct the garment. So what this does in learning is it creates an opportunity for them to make sure, it's like, do my notches match? Notches, if anybody sews, notches are kind of important. Did you label your pattern correctly? Of where is the grain line? How many are we cutting? Um, all of the information, how much is the seam allowance? all of the information that you then as the cutter draper have to then give to the first hand. Because the cutter draper in a professional shop is not cutting out all of the patterns. There's not enough time for that. Like, right, and that's when the first hand comes in 
and is going to then be doing that. And then the first hand then has to communicate to the stitchers what they're doing, right? You're gonna gather from this point to this point, right? So, and that's all of the information that has to happen on a pattern. So these were uh, three of her <clears throat> of their uh, half scales. And Abby really wanted to uh, really focus on the turn of the century because that's when our place was going to be set. So these are, we call our little half scales, they're really small, I should bring them, they're super cute. It's like a doll, and her name is Phoebe. So it's always nice, like when Phoebe gets to wear some clothes, some fancy clothes too. So after that, uh, I, I have a render, I have some research, I have a rendering, and then we have to give it to the, the cutter draper, they make the pattern, and then we do what's called a mock-up. So a mock-up is not made of the fashion fabric. So the fashion fabric is the pretty stuff and it's expensive. Like some fabric can be, you know, $10 a yard. I have, I have personally cut and also de designed fabric that is $180 a yard, right? You, you can't make mistakes when fabric is $180 a yard, like, right? So there's a process that we, that, we do. So this is uh, one of the actresses and she is in the mock-up of her act to dress um, or outfit. So in the fitting, we put it on and then we figure out fit um, or arm size. Is the arm size, uh, you know, too tight? Um, is it, does it need to come in on the sides? How is it hanging on her shoulders? Is she able to move? Um, we actually built this, we, we found this skirt pattern actually in stock and we made it and I was like, I don't like it. I don't like it. Remember Allie? I was like, I don't like it. And we said, and, and Allie was like, great, we'll do another skirt, right? So this is an opportunity to see all of those, those, um, things. And so after a fitting, the cutter draper then takes the mock-up and then alters the pattern to then be cut out of the fashion fabric. And sometimes if, if the alterations are kind of big, we actually do another mock-up to make sure. So th this is a mock-up and then this is actually her fashion fabric. And you're like, why is there a red sleeve? So this is a mock-up of the sleeve. Sleeves are one of almost one of the last things you wanna do in a fitting because we move a lot. We wanna make sure that that sleeve is, is gonna serve its purpose and is not gonna come out. So we do lots of like mock-ups of just the sleeves. So here's a couple of just images of the process of fittings. Here's another one of act two, a mock-up. Um, Abby's was in charge of creating the skirt. As like you can see, I gave them a research image and I said, this is the skirt I want, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And then they were able to create it with all of the pleats, um, the back, all of the movements of it, the bolero jacket, um, I have a, a, like a research image, but then I liked how there were like all of this little um, intricate detail work. So we added that into it. So there's some nice, beautiful pin, you know, pin tucks. So there's that. And then this is their finished garment. Um, there were a lot of things that we ought, that I had to think about because these people, the, the actresses took their coats on and off. So I needed to make sure that they weren't long enough that they could take them on and off on stage, all of that kind of stuff. So this is their final um, co you know, costume. This is Henrietta's act two. This was a research image, but then I, I, I wanted it to be a little bit different. So I said, this is what I kind of like this, like this coat dress. Um, it's not a coat, she's not gonna take her coat off, um, but it's almost like um, a surplus. So it kind of goes like latches over. So. That's Henrietta's. Um, this is Margaret's mock-up of her act two dress. And I loved this image so much that I said, this is the dress I want. I don't, this is it. I love it. Um, and as like, you can somewhat kind of see, there are a ton of like little tucks and pin tucks that go up into the back. Um, I, w I wanted it to be one piece. Um, I wanted it to have buttons down the center back she has a tight skirt underneath it because this is towards the teens. So that hobble skirt. So we, so we went from walking skirts that were really full to then those hobble skirts where they can't walk very fast, right? Um, and 
This is just a, um, another uh, fitting picture. So this is Allie that's handing me uh, like pins to be able to then mark the garment as like you can see, I'm marking the hem. She's in her real shoes that she's gonna be wearing for the show um, and all of that. And I like how Abby has all of these pins, like you really can't see it, but to keep all of those uh, tucks in place because we wanted them to be nice and crisp. And then we, and then after all of that, we, we've made the costumes, we have final fittings, we do all of that, and then we go into rehearsal, right? So this is just a picture of, of the director, Jennifer Chapman, giving us notes after a show. So the job of a, of a director is not just taking notes about the costumes, it's, they're also taking notes for acting, sound cues, light cues, all of this stuff. So, because the director has the overall vision. So that's that's Dr. Jennifer Chapman giving us some, some notes for the production. And here are just some production shots. Hopefully, like you can like go back and remember that in my research for Henrietta, I really wanted her to be in a plaid skirt. I found that and I was able to find some really beautiful plaid, wool plaid. Um, I because they're sisters, I wanted to have a really tight color palette to, to merge them together. But we have a scientist, and then we have a sister who is, uh, is into music. And that's actually how Henrietta figures out how to map the stars is through her sister um, playing um, the piano. So these are both of the actors. You can kind of see them together. I wanted them to be similar but different. Um, Henrietta, I wanted to have her be a, be a scientist. She also, the, the real um, Henrietta was hearing impaired. So I had to research hearing devices, a hearing aid during the turn of the century. And then we had to make that. But how softer and lighter her sister is comparatively to um, Henrietta. And here's some more pictures. These are all of the, the three sisters. I mean, all of the, the three scientists, ex, um, excuse me, we have Annie. We have Wilhelmina, and then we have uh, um, Henrietta. And all three of them, I wanted to also be in a tight color palette, but have very different different looks, but really rooted in the same feeling of them being scientists and working at Harvard and being amongst men as well. This is one of the end shots um, in Act Two. And then this is again uh, uh, just a production shot of of the show. Again, uh, having the the jackets had to come on and off, making sure that they weren't too long, that they had lining, um, all of that we weren't seeing the labels, of all of that kind of stuff that has to be in it. And as a costume designer, I am doing from top to bottom, so from their hair to their accessories to a belt to their shoes to their undergarments. They're all um, wearing period corsets, because they would, um, how that affects the fit, right? Um, we actually did measurements inside their fittings to make sure, because your body changes so when you, you know, put on a corset. We gave them corsets in, in rehearsal and rehearsal petticoats, so they knew how to move and walk, because you walk and you sit differently in a corset. This is um, Act Two dress, and you can see just the beautiful craftsmanship that Abby created with it. This is Wilhelmina, um, and her her research was very particular. It was really I was like, this is the jacket I want, um, and even the kind of fabric I chose. Stripes were really popular back then, so finding um, a stripe was a task <coughs> within itself of it and she's in blue, Annie was in purple, and then Henrietta and her sister was in, um, in yellow. And from my very first slide, um, you see the colors of the stars. I brought that into like rehearsal and I said, I mean into the, into the research and I said, this is my color palette that I, that I want to use. This is another production and we had to come up with the vote for the vote for women and, and their sashes and all of that for the cover, you know, covered buttons. You can kind of see a covered button, some glasses, lots of dickies and little collar pieces as well. This is the end shot 
um, of the show with all of all of the production elements from lighting to set, um, things you know having to move on and off. We did this in the thrust, which designing for the thrust in Riverside is much different than designing for the RCU. The RCU sits 1,200, um, a very large space comparatively to, to Riverside. And then this is my end slide. Um, I always like to bring my kids to um, productions and Pearl is, is this one, and this is her friend, Addie. Addie is a hockey player, um, and Pearl came up to Addie. I said, do you want to bring a friend to, you know, to final dress? And she goes, yeah, I want to bring Addie. And I was like, great. So this is how Pearl uh, told her friend about the show. She was like, Addie, do you like music? And I was like, yes. Do you like science? Yes. Do you like girls doing science? <laughs> yes. Then boy, do I have a show for you. <laughs> and that was, she should be in charge of all of our publicity, like, right? Um, it was like working on this production was such an, a, a great experience. One, it was connected to giving an opportunity to, to one of my students, um, being able to see them grow um, in confidence, taking basic patterning and then moving it into historical patterning, um, having a, a, having my voice in incredible with involved in a production that is rooted with real people and real women that opened the doors for fellow women to come behind them and the importance that stories give us. And as a costume designer, how can I help tell that story? It's giving my voice in, um, in, in this world. So that is kind of a quick run, run through. It did not, it was a long time. It took <laughs> us a while. Um, so trying to, like, how do you take all of this hard work and a lot of time and talk about it in 20 minutes when we worked for months on this production? Um, and then it st struck. And then we put it in costume storage, and then hopefully we'll use it again. And that's what's so great about theater. So that's the show. That's my little presentation of what we did with our ORSP grant. So thanks. So I didn't know if you had any questions or if you want me to get Abby up here, and they can talk about a little bit of their experience, what they took from it. Abby, why don't you come up here? <laughs> I have to kind of toot my little own horn. Toot, toot. Is Abby actually joined me this past summer at working in Utah. Um, I, I designed Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat in Utah. And Abby actually came as, um, a, st as a stitcher and then a wardrobe person. And uh, Abby there, she was a rock star. Um, and I was, I couldn't have been more proud of, of, of her, of them and all of their awesome talents, um, and how fast and quick you are. Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 They're not going to toot their, their own horn. So, so why don't you talk about what was like something that you took out of, I'm going to come over here, um, that you took out of this experience. And now, hold on, back up. Now Abby is actually designing our next show, which is the Bald Soprano. So um, I hopefully giving them the skill set as a cutter draper and then being able to use that to then be now the costume designer for our next our like our next main stage. Wait, I don't have a ton to say about it, but um, really grateful for the opportunity and to be able to like have a, a block like a flat pattern and turn it into something pretty beautiful it literally feels like magic <laughs> like i get done with it i'm like holy cow what did i just do so yeah so that. i know that ali and i get really jealous of abby <laughs> um abby has a brain it was I mean, really easy to do this project because i literally said we're going to do this and this and they just really picked up on it really quickly um they really have this great mindset, um, just this natural talent 
that I wish that I had. Um, but yeah. Anything else? I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't have done it without you as well. I'm mean, like, right? I think that that's what's so great about um, like ORSP is it really gives us an opportunity for our students to have an opportunity that we wouldn't necessarily have. I mean, um, or time, like, right? That this was an opportunity for us to carve out time to have one-on-one -on -one instruction and then the results um, to then be able to have them be seen. Um, on stage, and then there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Like, right, Gretchen. So, Eric, did did you sew? Is that how you got into this area, or how, or was it through through theater, and then you locked in on the costuming, or how did you get there? And could yeah. you repeat the question? So, how it was? How did Abby get involved in in this through sewing or theater? So, yeah. So I had. A little bit of theater experience in middle school, but nothing more than like a like a choir chorus role. And then, if you've heard of cosplay, it's mm -hmm. like recreating costumes from shows. So I did that a lot in high school, and I really just fell in love with sewing. And when I got to college, I was away from my sewing machine and didn't have a lot of space or time, and I was really just looking for opportunities to get back behind the sewing machine, and my freshman year roommate was interested in theater, so I went just like randomly to a, a theater event, just talking about what would be happening at the university that year. And I met Amanda. I remember, <laughs> little freshman. <laughs> yeah. And um, like, is there a place that I could sew? Just like, come to the it. costume shop, help us. Yes, there is. <laughs> and I showed up, and then I realized that I could, I felt happy doing it every second of the day. I feel like I'd probably do this until I died and be pretty okay with it. So. Yeah, so one of their first projects was actually for She Killed Monsters. Um, and I remember seeing it and she was just like, will this work? And I was like, that'll do, pig, that'll do. From like, <laughs> babe. I was like, yes, this is like really, really good. And then we hired her them in, in you know, the shop. And Abby took the costume construction class, which she was way advanced, you know, for it. She knew how to do all of the things. So actually, I had her kind of almost be a TA, um, helping other students around her, because the best way to actually learn is to teach. And so, and I saw just this natural ability to be around people, to communicate things. And I was like, I think I have a job for you. I have this opportunity. Um, and I wanted in the costume studio to really try to model what it is to work in a professional costume studio. And that year, I, I like I turned to Allie and I go, I really want to have a cutter draper in the shop, and that is going to be Abby's role. So they will be doing the patterning, and of course Allie as well. Um, and it, it, that's what that's what what happened. And then we took her to Utah, and. She fixed a lot of mistakes from other people that were not as skilled, um, but it was great for her to be able to like understand that as well. So, yeah. And now she's doing the Bald Soprano. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, where did a lot of your research like come from? Like, what were your sources for those things? From uh, all over. I usually start with Pinterest. Right, you start and then you go down the dark hole of Pinterest. Um, I remember in graduate school going to the library with dimes to photocopy. Um, but they, I, I, books, Pinterest, what's so great about Pinterest now is we have so many access to actual real um, images of historical clothing <clears throat> that now we are seeing in private collections or in basements in like museums. That's what's so great about it. Is, and then real photographs of real people in real clothes, um, which is great, instead of um, like a secondary source, which would have been like a, like a magazine ad, right? That then kind of skews what we would be actually seeing with like real people. <laughs> Margaret. So I'm wondering about whether or not, because you're creating something, I mean, I'm used to patterns and you get the instructions, you know, the whole thing, it's all packaged up for you. So 
did did you do documentation? I mean, because you you had to write some things I know on the patterns and mm -hmm. what you're going to do, but then sort of construction wise, uh, how, does do you have to kind of document that a little bit? So in terms of putting together like the steps for what part goes with there, um, so I did some writing down, mm -hmm. but a, a lot of the time I was with the stitcher that would be putting it together, so they were able to come up to me and ask. Uh, what the next step would be and then I would be able to verbally tell them. But yes, Abby did do instructions of like, you're going to sew from here to here. You're okay. going to gather from here to here. Okay. Um, but we're really lucky that we have, a, that they were in, in the shop and most cut, uh, you know, cut, you know, cutter drapers are in the shop, but there, that is a next step for a cutter draper is actually writing down all of the instructions. So it's like technical writing, you know, you're going to take right. the center front, you're going to connect it to, you know, the side seams at the notches, blah, blah, blah. You're going to use one inch you know, seam allowance, yeah. Yeah. all of the, all of the, that stuff as well. Yeah. So it's sort of a multi-part question, but you mentioned at one point finding historical patterns. So do you use existing patterns ever rather than patterning your own? And if so, are there like, issues of like copyright of using do you have to credit other um patterns if you use them or do you ever like sell the patterns you create to other shows that kind of reuse of well for patterning like you can get on itsy and find like the pants pattern that we got you just pay for it and you download it mm -hmm. um and then, but you have to be really careful because a lot of these instructions were made from when they didn't have sewing machines or sergers. So they're like, their steps, it's like, well, we don't have to do that because we have a serger, like, right? Or just the way that they were um, constructed. Um, so yes, we do use commercial patterns um, because we also have to think about time, like, right? There's only so much time. And if I can go and buy a 99 cent pattern, a Butterick pattern that is exactly like what I need, we're gonna do that. But we didn't, but there wasn't a pattern for the dress that I really wanted for Margaret. So that's when a, like a cutter draper comes in, you know, to play. Um, we don't have to get, we don't, there's not a copyright cause we're like, we're purchasing it. Like, right. I wouldn't then sell that again. Like we're like, cause like that's not right. Um, but yes, and it happens everywhere. It's not just me being lazy. It's, it's just time, resources, and if there's a lot of period patterns now. And now, you know, the Butterick and Simplistic, they got on the bandwagon. There's a lot of people that want to do cosplay. There's lots of people that will want to dress up like a princess, right? And if you ever go to a Butterick or, a, or Simplistic, they'll have a costume section and then you're like look at it it's like oh those are costumes from a famous movie you know like pirates of the caribbean you can find a pirates of the caribbean pattern like, right because everybody wanted to be jack sparrow when it came out <laughs> right or uh downton abbey right um so yep any other questions well, we are getting ready. We are in our second run of the spelling bee, which is more contemporary. Um, and then, but our next show is the Bald Soprano. So you should come and, and support Abby and seeing all of their hard work. And, and, and it is actually set in period. It's in the 50s in, um, in England. And we're, we're working really hard on that and figuring out some things. So yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you.